The Mercedes-Benz story is about quality and performance. It's about the struggle to maintain a standard of excellence that began more than a century ago with the words of Gottlieb Daimler, the best or nothing. Today, Mercedes is known for high-performance luxury cars, as well as vehicles designed for civilized off-roading. While the company continues to look to the future, it's never forgotten the past. Gottlieb Daimler was the first to harness the wide variety of uses for gasoline-burning internal combustion engines. The success of his first vehicle, the motorcycle, convinced him that installing an engine in a carriage could allow him to replace the horse. Only 60 miles away, Carl Benz was unaware of the work being done by Daimler. He was developing his own vehicle. While Daimler was putting his engine in a carriage, Benz was building the world's first automobile from the ground up, shown here at a much later celebration. It was first driven in late 1885, and the anniversary of when Benz patented his motor wagon on January 29, 1886, is celebrated as the birthday of the automobile. Daimler's horseless carriage debuted several months later. Daimler sold his engines around the world. His biggest market was France, where the automobile really took off. The world's first automobile race was held in France in 1894. The 78-mile event from Paris to Rouen included many steam and gasoline-powered vehicles, Races like this helped to convince the world that the automobile was practical. Daimler engines powered both the Peugeot and Panhard, the joint first prize winners. As Daimler searched for new uses for his engines, Carl Benz focused on building cars and was soon a leading manufacturer in the fledgling auto industry. By 1900, Benz had produced over 2,000 cars and had become the world's largest auto manufacturer. At the beginning of the 20th century, automobiles were playthings for the wealthy. They liked to display their prizes in elegant parades, often held in resorts like Nice or Baden-Baden. It gave them a place to wow the common folk. A successful Austrian businessman, Jamil Jelinek, who lived in Nice, was an early fan of the automobile. He offered to purchase 36 cars from Daimler if he built a model that would win an upcoming local race. For placing this large order, Jelinek demanded the right to have the new car named after his daughter, Mercedes. These innovative and technically advanced cars soon dominated events at Nice. It was called the car of the day after tomorrow. The Mercedes era had begun. Racing was the proving ground for the automobile, and the most important contest during the first years of the 20th century was the Grand Prix of the Automobile Club of France. Crowds turned out to see the daredevil drivers risk their lives and to marvel at the machines. At the 1908 Grand Prix, Christian Lautensberger drove a Mercedes to victory with an average speed of 69 miles per hour. The Benz cars finished second and third. Yeah. 
Mercedes swept the 1914 French Grand Prix, finishing first, second, and third. But the German victors received a chilly reception from the French crowd. War was looming, and a month later, it began. Peace finally returned in 1919. All over the world, optimism unleashed an onslaught of demand for new cars. Henry Ford's mass production techniques began to spread in Europe. Even though Germany was financially devastated, there were over 80 automobile makers there. Unfortunately, few Germans could afford a car. In order to survive, the two industry pioneers, Daimler and Benz, decided to join forces. The new company, Daimler-Benz, was launched in 1926. The origin of the famous three-pointed star isn't clear. Some believe it was Gottlieb Daimler's lucky star. Others think it stood for travel on land, sea, and air. It is now combined with the Benz wreath, and the name Mercedes-Benz adorned an ever-growing lineup of cars. Mercedes made cars for the fashionable and well-heeled. The company manufactured an array of lively cars that no longer required drivers to dress up to drive. They could wear normal street clothes, press the starter, and move on. No more need to crank start the cars or wear goggles, heavy coats, and headgear. Motoring had become civilized and fun. The cars that rolled off the joint production line would allow Daimler-Benz to survive and prosper. They began to develop exciting new models. Mercedes launched the supercharged era in 1927 with the SK and then the more powerful SSKs. These muscular cars appealed to gentlemen racers like Manfred von Brauhitsch, who was reunited in 2000 with the car he drove to victory in 1929. The 95-year-old von Brauhitsch traveled to a town outside of Salzburg to participate in a recreation of the Geisberg hill climb. He wanted to relive the excitement of these cars. The SSK was the most successful car that Mercedes had at the time. While it was built for the road, it earned its reputation racing. SSKs competed in over 90 races and won countless times. As the SSK broke through the fog, it was easy to see why the supercharged six-cylinder engines set the standard on the track and on the road in the 1920s. While the SSKs were winning races, a new generation of road cars was about to emerge. By 1934, Mercedes-Benz was ready to launch the 500K Special Roadsters. Today, these are among the world's most desirable collector cars. These high-performance cars were usually fitted with beautiful custom-built bodies that transformed them into some of the sexiest cars ever produced. They were good-looking and fast. They had a five-liter supercharged eight-cylinder engine that produced a hundred horsepower. But when you put the pedal all the way to the floor, the supercharger delivered an additional 60 horsepower. This 1936 500K was originally purchased in England by a wealthy insurance broker who saw it displayed at London's Olympia Motor Show. The car went through several different owners. In 1956, it was purchased by a butcher. He only drove the vehicle a year before it started to have some minor mechanical problems. Instead of repairing the car, he stored it in a shed behind his house and never touched it again. In 1988, it was rediscovered. It was in bad shape. It was rusty. Mice had burrowed into the seats and eaten the upholstery. Despite its condition, a private collector 
paid $2.7 million for the car. Today, the restored butcher's car is estimated to be worth over $4 million. In 1936, Mercedes introduced a new supercharged vehicle, the 540K. This was a natural next step for the 500Ks. It was basically the same car, but it had a larger engine that produced more horsepower. Once again, different coach builders created stunning custom bodies for these rare cars. The 540Ks were the top of the line Mercedes in the mid to late 30s. Today, these cars, which serious and wealthy car collectors lost after, fetch millions of dollars. The 500Ks and 540Ks were the ultimate cars for people who demanded and could afford the fastest and the best. While building the ultimate cars for the road, Mercedes was also creating revolutionary race cars dubbed the Silver Arrows. From 1934 to 1939, these aerodynamic cars dominated Grand Prix racing in Europe. They used exotic materials that were too expensive for the company's passenger cars, but gave the powerful racers a performance edge. A specially prepared version of the Silver Arrows set a world speed record of 268 miles per hour in 1938. Drivers with cloth helmets but no seat belts became heroes like movie stars today to the hordes of fans who turned out to see their death-defying exploits. It all came to an end when war broke out in Europe. By the time the war ended, Daimler-Benz had practically ceased to exist. It would be a tremendous struggle to rebuild the company and to start growing again. It was helped by the post-war booming demand for automobiles. Daimler was able to retool and start producing cars. They attracted a skilled workforce that welcomed the opportunity to rebuild the company. By the early 1950s, new cars were streaming out of its factories. The company made cars for different budgets. For those who could afford luxury and high performance, there was the 300S. Its six-cylinder, three-liter engine was soon put to use, powering the exciting 300SL, or Sports Light. The 300SL burst onto the scene in 1952. Its high revving engine powered both roadsters and coupes. The cars either won or finished second in every major race they entered, including Le Mans and the grueling 3500 kilometer Carrera Pan America, a remarkable return to racing. By 1954, Mercedes was ready to re-enter Formula Grand Prix racing with the W196. The cars debuted at the French Grand Prix with a first and second place finish. Mercedes attracted the best drivers, including Juan Manuel Fangio, who left Maserati to race for the team. His first season in the W196 earned him the world champion title. Mercedes continued to excel on the world's racetracks in 1955. The anticipation was high when they returned to Le Mans. They would be competing with the world's best cars, Ferrari, Porsche, Jaguar, and the best drivers. Over 250,000 spectators gathered to watch Europe's classic sports race. They were thrilled watching the cars break records on every lap. Then, everything changed. One of the Mercedes hit an Austin Healey 
and burst into flames as it veered off the track. The wreckage cut through the crowd, killing more than 80 people and injuring hundreds more. Mercedes withdrew from the race and from racing. The company wouldn't return to Formula Grand Prix racing for 40 years. But racing inspired the creation of a new car. They used the same tubular chassis and body style as the Pan American race cars. A hinged steering wheel helped drivers get in and out. It had a three liter fuel injected engine that made it a real performer. The 300 SL was born. The distinctive gull wing doors made it one of the most stunning cars of its day. Although Mercedes had withdrawn from racing, private owners competed with the 300 SLs at events around the world. Its pedigree as a race car helped it stand out against the competition. And its 160 miles per hour top speed made it a strong contender against Corvettes and the era's other sports cars. The cars developed a cult following with celebrities and automotive enthusiasts. Many of the 1,400, 300 SLs that were built still exist today. These stylish and roadworthy cars are popular with collectors who love to get together to drive their prized possessions. A 300 SL Gullwing Coupe, in excellent condition, can command over $300,000. It pays to keep them polished. The Gullwing doors were arrested, but some people wanted something more conventional. The 190 SL and the 300 SL Roadsters replaced the revolutionary Gullwings. Some came with removable hardtops. These sporty cars also continue to be chased by collectors. By the late 1950s, Daimler-Benz was working on a replacement for its popular line of sedans. These cars had served the company well, but it was time for a change. In 1959, a new car line sporting the American-inspired tail fins began to roll off the assembly lines. Today, these cars are referred to as the tail fin models. But the real story was beneath the spacious and elegant car bodies. These cars set the pace for passenger safety. They were the first autos to use a patented process to make the passenger compartments much sturdier and to employ front and rear crush zones. These crush zones absorbed the force of the impact and provided a safety zone for the area's occupants. It would be years before this design became common in the industry. The interiors were also made to be much safer. Upholstered dashboards with flexible and recessed knobs and a padded steering wheel were installed to enhance passenger safety. Over 340,000 cars and chassis using this basic design were built from 1959 to 1968. This kept the factory busy and also provided the basis for an updated new sports roadster. The new 230SL was unveiled to the media in 1963. This sports car had to struggle to eclipse its legendary predecessors, the 300 and 190 SLs. This challenge was made more difficult by the fact that the car was somewhat of a compromise. It really wasn't an all-out high-performance sports car, nor was it just a comfortable boulevard cruiser. It was a little of each. It offered comfort, safety, good performance, and attractive but somewhat controversial styling. The dispute centered on the avant-garde large side windows and concave roof. According to the designer, the windows contributed to safety by increasing driver visibility, and the roof to survivability in a crash by adding stiffness to the car.
At first, people weren't quite sure what to think when they saw one on the street. No one can deny that the cars attracted attention. Although the 230SL and its successor, the 280SL, weren't known for their performance, the cars did have some success in rallies. In 1963, a team led by Eugene Boehringer drove Mercedes in a series of events that earned him the title of European champion for that year, including a victory at the Sofia Liège rally. In 1971, a new sports car was ready, the 350 SL. It continued the trend of adding more safety, comfort and luxury to the company's whole lineup. Fuel economy was also a concern because of gas shortages. These cars carved out a niche for luxury and performance that no other company was able to meet. Mercedes continued to hold its lead in this category with the 500 SL, another car designed with sporty luxury in mind. Even though it had become a world leader in luxury and performance, company executives felt that it was necessary to find a partner to help them compete in the world market. In November of 2000, Daimler-Benz and Chrysler combined in what was called a merger of equals. The goal was to give each partner something essential that it lacked. Chrysler would get a presence outside the United States, and Daimler-Benz get mass market know-how and a foothold in the world's largest market, North America. Chrysler's entrepreneurial culture and ability to get things done quickly and cheaply attracted Daimler, but many of its talented group of top American executives deserted or were pushed out after the merger. Some believe this is one of the reasons that the merger hasn't worked quite as planned. Even though the relationship proved to be bumpy, Mercedes was able to develop a range of new vehicles, including a luxury SUV. There was a burst of new cars, many with performance options, that put the fun back into driving. Mercedes' renewed passion for performance started showing up in this impressive array of ever-increasingly powerful cars. Some combined the technology used in its Formula One race cars. This gave these sexy new cars world-class handling and speed, a clear attempt to combine heritage with modern technology. Mercedes-Benz bridges the origins of the automobile in the last century and the high-tech world of the future. It's to be expected that they'll continue to be guided by Gottlieb Daimler's motto that one should build the best or nothing at all.